Hey, how's it going? This is episode six of Sound Editing for Visual Media. And in the next two episodes, as promised, we're gonna talk about EQs and compressors, the salt and pepper of audio production. I'm gonna share with you some common do's and don'ts. Then we're gonna jump into Reaper and EQ a field recording to make a bed track. Then we're gonna EQ a sound effect. And after that, I'll show you some common tricks to achieve some commonly requested effects. Now, this video will walk you through practical appliances of EQing, but I'm gonna assume that you at least have a basic understanding of what an EQ is. I initially intended not to assume this, but this video would have easily been two hours long if we were gonna discuss what EQs are, how they work, what different types of EQs there are. I will briefly touch on all of this in the blog post. As long as you have a basic understanding of what EQs are and what they do and how to use them, this video should give you more than a few tips and tricks on how to apply EQing to sound effects. Something to know is that EQing sound effects is vastly different than EQing anything in a musical context. With music, we are trying to achieve a certain tone with EQing. With sound effects, we are usually using EQs to modify a sound to fit with our needs in a certain scene, or we are using it surgically to remove some problem areas from a recording. Now, the average movie audience may not know anything about EQing, but they know a synthetic sound when they hear it. And their attention peaks when something doesn't sound right. With sound effects, we want to refrain from doing anything too drastic. The aim of sound effects in most movies is to immerse the audience into the environment of the film. So we don't want to attract any unwanted attention into an audio we place in a film and distract from the story in the process. So while your knowledge of musical equalization will definitely help you here, there are certain practices that you may want to unlearn from your music making days when you're EQing sound effects. Anyway, let's jump into Reaper and get straight into EQing. So I got a short field recording of the sound of rain on a wooden surface here that I recorded on my porch, and we're gonna get a cueing. The first step is simply to listen to it for a bit. One thing I see people do a lot is to solo bands and sweep through the frequency spectrum to look for problem areas. I don't like this approach because soloing bands is nothing but filtering all bands and boosting a very narrow one. Everything in this context sounds a little annoying and definitely synthetic. In real life, sounds almost never only occur in a limited band. So when we do this, we are immediately listening to a very synthetic sound and then making decisions based on that, which is not really good. So what's better to do is to first estimate the rough area of a sound we want to get rid of and then use the soloing function to pinpoint that band. So I'm simply listening for sounds I don't like and then guessing. Is it a low end sound? Is it a high end sound? Is it kind of in the mids? Is it in the subs? Stuff like that. You will get better at doing this with time and as you develop your ear. You can also use audio meaning trying to recreate that sound roughly with your mouth. If the sound is pitched in any way, like wind is, it should be easy to recreate it. If it's not, that already eliminates everything in the human voice range from your possible frequency band. If it's lower than any sound you can recreate, well, that narrows it down to basically anything below 100 hertz. And if it's higher, well, you can at least sweep up from about 1K and quickly find it. So one thing I'm kind of hearing, and I'm hearing it more on the left, maybe you're hearing it too, is just like... And I think that's in this band, like 100 to 500 kind of area. So I usually reserve my first band for shelving. So I'm going to just use this band to try to find it. Yeah. You hear this? This right here. This is where I find jarring, so I'm going to work on this. So once we pinpoint the area we want to cut, I like to start by cutting some general amount, maybe 3 to 5 dB, and then I'm going to adjust the Q, which is how wide we want to cut from the center frequency outward in both directions. Generally speaking, in non-surgical applications, we want a somewhat wide Q. But after finding our center frequency and Q, we will decide on a final amount of reduction, and this may change again down the line as we cut or boost other bands. We also need some kind of high-pass filtering on all bed tracks. If you look at your audio through the scope of an EQ, you're always seeing some sound occur below 80 hertz. However, these sounds are barely audible and they are not necessarily needed for bed tracks. We want to reserve this band for impactful low end on sound effects, but with bed tracks, 99 out of 100 times, we can just cut those out. So in this case, I would solo the low cut band and sweep up until I start hearing any kind of sound. So I'm still not hearing anything. So right around 34 hertz, I'm starting to hear something, but it's still not useful. Rumbly, roary stuff. Even what we're hearing now is not really useful for a rain track. It's nice. It sounds pretty good, actually, but it's not for a rain track. So I'm going to... 
Leave my low cut there. So this is where like EQing for music and uh, sound effects become really different because when we're when we're EQing sound effects, we're EQing BG tracks. Our aim is for realism. We want to put the audience in an environment that they're familiar with. You can't create stuff like this, right? Like very weird and very sudden changes in EQ are arguably permissible when you're synth designing in music. But with sound effects, we don't want to do anything too crazy. We don't want to create any resonance because all those things sound very digital and fake and you want to avoid that. So as our EQ curve begins to take shape, we can cut or boost a lot by dB amount, but we don't want the curve to have any kind of sudden peaks and troughs. We want it somewhat linear overall. Another thing I'm hearing is some raindrops really poking out in the 5K range and above, but that's more of a dynamic problem than an EQ problem. So it's best to tackle that with compression and not necessarily EQ because so much of the rain character is in that range and we don't want to turn those down for the whole sound just to get rid of those raindrops so it's best to use compressors to get those to poke out less so back to EQing I heard some stuff in the 1k band that I wanted to boost so again I listen for it first and then I use band soloing to find that exact area that I was listening for and let's see if we need to take anything off the top We clearly begin to hear a lot of character loss with a straight high cut, but I do want to reduce that acidic range of the sound a bit, so I'll instead use a shelf low pass EQ to get that slightly under control. Once we decide on our final EQ curve, we may see that we lost some volume there as the bar on the left of my EQ shows. So we can then adjust the output gain to bring that close to zero so we can AB it more objectively. When we AB, we want to eliminate variables like loudness so that we can actually judge the quality of the EQ. And now let's AB it. Another thing we have done is that we cut a lot of frequencies that are present in a dialogue track. So this will also help dialogue sit better with our bed tracks. And if you remember, dialogue is king. So just to show you, I'm going to import one line of dialogue into our project and we're going to hear it while A being our EQ track. So let's try without first. The rich don't come down here except to suck up more resources. Not bad, audible for sure. But let's check it out with EQ on. The rich don't come down here, except to suck up more resources. So already even without having turned this down, and normally obviously you would, you don't want your BGs to be hidden this area. You want to turn your BGs down, but already it's way more clear. The rich don't come down here, except to suck up more resources. To me, that sounds much better than this. The rich don't come down here, except to suck up more resources. So that was a little bit on EQing field recordings. So as we mentioned before, we have some sounds over here that kind of jump around. I want to tackle those next. So in the EQing stage, we identified some areas where there was too much dynamic difference, like the 5K and above. Now I'm going to use a multiband dynamics to kind of bring those down to a reasonable range. What we want to do now is to reduce the dynamic range of the file so that it can actually serve as a bed track. You don't want to lie in a bed that has a lot of nails sticking out. So with the same logic, you don't want a bed track that has some sounds like poking out and possibly distracting us from the dialogue and anything else happening in the scene. So after I do some multiband compression, I'm going to apply a limiter. Now we're going to tackle both of these topics next week because again, it'll be too much to cover in this week. So we're just going to keep focusing on EQing. But I just wanted you to see that EQ is not your only tool when it comes to audio production and balancing sounds and making an appropriate bed track. So let's look at some sound effects. I got an audio file that I just brought in here and I've changed the playback rate. Let's listen to it. When we change the playback rate of a sound, we are causing every frequency to slow down. So if we slow something down by half, any frequency at 1K is now at 500 Hertz. Anything at 30 Hertz is now at 15 Hertz below our hearing range. And sounds at 20K have been brought down to 10K. This topic deserves its own video, but what you can probably hear quite clearly in this recording is that there's this really high end sharp frequency in the audio that I'm not trying to find and get rid of. This one's easy to find because I can quite clearly see that frequency poking out. So I'm just trying to get it under control. Notice that I'm using a really narrow cue because I want to just affect that frequency and none of the other frequencies. I'm also using a high cut because I want to get rid of that sharp drop around the 12K mark from how we shifted our playback speed. So now we have the sharp tone under control. But still, around that area, there's some more sounds that I find unpleasant. That's why you see that other bell curve that I put around the sharper bell. Next, I'm going to tackle the low end. There's some frequencies that poke out way too much. 
They would be fine at the normal playback rate, but when slowed down just cause too much bass in an area I don't want there to be too much bass in. I'm also putting a low cut there, cause obviously we don't want auditory data where we can't hear it, so let's get rid of those. Hopefully if you're an astute observer, you will have noticed that we have changed the character of the sound a lot, and not necessarily for the best. That's because I'm first trying to get the ranges to how I would eventually want them. And next I'm gonna use automation to make sure those are only applied where I want them. So I'm gonna bring in my high cut frequency as an automation lane and I'm gonna begin to draw. Now the first few ones are how you wouldn't wanna do it because we can quite clearly hear the automation curve. It's too sharp and we hear it like a filtering in a synth. I want this to be gradual and almost not make itself known while also cutting down that high end noise that we were hearing earlier. You can open your EQ and use the visual analyzer to guide yourself in this process as well. That sounds pretty good to me. Now I'm gonna bring in the next lane. The band that we were using to bring down the low end at the beginning, once the sound starts to die out, we don't want it to die out so quickly and we don't wanna help it dying out. So I'm gonna do the opposite of that movement with the other band so that as the sound starts to die, that band starts to get boosted and that way we'll get a longer tail with a more kind of impact for low end. So as you can see, once you combine the power of equalization with automation, there's really not a lot you can't do. So I'm just rinsing and repeating with the other bands and I'm shaping my sound completely, both in terms of its frequency content, but also its overall envelope. Now this is something you can do with dynamic EQs, but it will take a really long time. And with more complex automation like this, dialing that in in a dynamic EQ is arguably really stupid and really time consuming. So what I can do is just quickly automate this process. What I'm essentially doing is I'm bringing down the high end as the sound is dying and that noise starts to come up and I'm boosting the low end and I'm creating a better tail for the sound. And my end result is something that is virtually unrecognizable from the sound that I started with and exactly what I wanted it to be. So with one plugin, we both designed our sound a little bit and got rid of a bunch of noise. And all of that came at no sacrifice to the sound quality and character. Hey Joey, how you doing? So I recorded this dialogue line, let's hear it. Hey Joey, how you doing? I'm not a voice actor, but it's fine enough for our application. We want to make this sound like a phone. So let's loop it. Hey Joey, how you doing? And I got this EQ curve right here, let's hear it. Hey Joey, how you doing? So it's a super simple EQ curve. It's a low cut plus a high cut plus a mid boost. And this is how phones work, especially back in the day, there was severe limitation on data transmission. So they didn't want to transmit all the frequencies of your voice. What they want to transmit was enough of your voice that it could be intelligible on the other side. They would filter it severely both in the high end and low end, just keeping the area of the speech that we really need to hear in order to understand what the person is saying. It's not the best quality, but it's fine enough. To tackle loudness, they would just compress the audio pretty severely. So what I got here is a very low attack and very high ratio and the threshold is set pretty low. So I get all my sound kind of an even amount of loudness. Hey Joey, how you doing? Hey Joey, how you doing? Hey Joey, how you doing? Now optionally you would add distortion if it is an old phone you're trying to replicate, but with modern phones that EQ curve is really all you need. It's again worthy to mention that with films we're not necessarily going for ultimate realism, we still need intelligibility. So if at any point you need to sacrifice a bit of realism to make the dialogue be heard, then you gotta do it. But just for giggles this is the final sound of the vintage phone. Hey Joey, how you doing? I recently competed in the SOE sound design competition and was actually one of the winners. We had to sound design for a robot and the last thing I wanted to make the robot scream and I wanted the screams to gradually move away from the listener and sound further away. I achieved this using a plugin called Proximity EQ Plus which has a proximity offset parameter built in. So it can be used to fix recordings that were done from possibly further away than they should have been done but it can also make closer recordings sound further away. What this knob does is essentially apply a high cut filter plus some amount of reverberation. But reverb aside, you can simply use a high cut EQ to make something sound further away. The reason this works is because higher frequencies move more often per second than lower frequency sounds, so they decay faster. So when we are far away from a sound, the higher frequencies aren't making it to our ears, whereas the lower frequencies are. This is why when you leave a club, you can continue to hear the bass and kick for a block or more, but the high end of the audio gets absorbed into the walls and lost as you take distance. So Proximity EQ Plus is a great sound design and sound editing tool, but even if you don't have it, simply applying high cut to any 
sound effect will contribute to it sounding further away than recorded. This is by no means the only method to achieve distance, and I will cover the topic of making things sound further away in its own video, but there you go. Similarly, if you want any sound to feel muffled, you simply have to apply some high cut to it. Let me out of this box! So that's it for today. I hope this video gives you at least some pointers to start EQing. Obviously, we didn't discuss everything there is to discuss in the interest of time, but hopefully you can see that a simple combination of an EQ plus automation already opens up a world of possibilities for you to start messing with your sounds and modifying them. And that's all before you bring in any other plugin, like reverbs, delays, modulation effects, and all sorts of things, all of which we will explore in future videos. Also be aware that while EQing is one of the basic steps in audio production, it is by no means the simplest. In in fact, it's one of the hardest to master. There are people who can do any number of crazy things with sound design and all kinds of effects, but they would be the first to admit that EQ is not their strong suit. What's important is that you start using what you learned today right away. Begin tuning your ears right away, and if you've already done tons of EQing with music, do a ton more with sound effects. I'll also be releasing some ear training and EQ quizzes on my website soon, so stay tuned for those, and in my blog post, I will show you some already existing ear training tools that can help you in your quest to develop your ears. Don't expect your EQing skills or your ear to develop overnight. Don't be discouraged if it takes you months or even years. This is normal. It's a lifelong pursuit and something that, at least at the beginning, you're expected to do even if you don't fully understand it. Because doing is how you earn some understanding as well and theoretical knowledge alone won't help you here. To get back to our culinary analogy about EQ being the salt of audio production, a chef may quicker learn how to deglaze a pan, sous vide the steak, or roast the whole turkey than learn to estimate how much salt a dish needs, which may take a lifetime to get down to a science. And also, much like salting a dish, this stuff is to taste. Ultimately, if a sound feels like it has too much or too little low end for you, you're probably right and you should trust your instincts and intuition. Whenever you're unsure, remember that less is more. If you start with a decent bass recording or find the correct file from a library that works for the scene you're working on, you've already won half the battle. And also remember that every sound you put in an editing session is still gonna go through a post-production mixer. And while they would appreciate having to do very little to your sounds before mixing, it is their job and sometimes you need to let them do it. They'll also be hearing everything together. So while you as the editor may not have access to the latest music that's been approved or the latest ADR files, they would be hearing every final sound. So some decisions are best left to them anyway. At the beginning when you EQ, make sure to dial back on all the changes you've made a little bit so that you have room for error. If you cut something by 12 dB that should only be cut 3 dB, it's harder to boost that back up than to just cut it down less than 12 dB to begin with. So one good suggestion is once you come up with your curve, make your cues less steep and make your reductions and boosts less intense. Check the blog post for more info. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you next week.